bit sweet. That's probably a little hoppy. Uh, I don't know. I like it. It's fizzy. It's light. It gets you really messed up if you're not careful. Uh, but I'm drinking a stout, uh, mostly because at this place I can't really handle the IPA. The American revolutionaries were beer drinkers who fought for a free society. While the American experiment hasn't always lived up to their expectations, they would be astounded by the prosperity that we take for granted, and they would love today's American beer. The people who came from Europe to settle in the Americas brought beer with them. English, Dutch, German, and Czech immigrants built breweries wherever they settled, and by 1870 there were more than 4,000 breweries in the U.S. Refrigeration led to consolidation and decreased that number to around 1,500 by the beginning of the 20th century. And then, of course, prohibition decimated the industry completely. Only a small fraction of the breweries managed to reopen after prohibition was repealed. During World War II, at the request of the government, many breweries produced lower alcohol beer for the troops, and our boys came home with a taste for lighter beer. In the 1950s and 60s, the construction of the interstate highway system and the emergence of TV led to the first national brands. Live life, every golden minute of it. Enjoy Budweiser. It reduced choice, and they could do it because they'd, you know, they'd achieved these economies of scale that allowed them to deliver product at such inexpensive prices. And by 1980, there were less than 50 breweries left in the United States. I guess it's military. Last one down by. Right. <laughs> Well, I started drinking at a very early age. I, I, I grew up in St. Louis. So I was raised on Budweiser and Bush. I don't think there was any Bud in the house when I was growing up. There was Falstaff, there was Hams, yeah. there was Pat's Blue Ribbon. Old Style was an important beer back then. Yeah. You know, I mean, Old Milwaukee and all these beers were they were they were that was the stuff you drank. And I grew up in Eastern Pennsylvania. We drank, you know, Yingling and. Schmidt's, Ortley, the regional breweries. Yeah. Went to college and ended up working in a bar. We had Bud, Bud Light, Bush on tap. You know, if, if Budweiser would run out, I'd throw a Bush keg on and nobody ever called me on it. <laughs> I think the first time I had a wow factor with beer was when I was in the Navy in the Philippines drinking San Miguel. And that just blew me away. I never had anything like that. I moved to New York City. I played in an army band and uh, we started going to jazz clubs. And at that time in New York, they had just started importing Bass Ale, and Pilsner Urkel, and Guinness. And the imports started creeping in, and people started detecting the opportunity to buy differently. They were more expensive, but it seemed well worth it. Craft beer and microbreweries really grew out of home brewing as people started making bigger and more flavorful beers. I mean, I know some guys from in the early, early stages of Sierra Nevada, you know, Bob August and Ken Gosh. Sure. And uh, that we've talked a bunch with them, and they were like, you know, we just made the beers that we like to make as home brews. I ended up to Eureka to visit a friend and stopped in the Hopland Brewery, and uh, things have never been the same. Yeah. Little Blackhawk Stout sitting back in the corner, listening to music, drinking that mysterious dark beer, going, what is this? And then, of course, you know, the hops happened to grow up north, and as craft brewing became more interesting, hop growers started fooling around, and they came up with new varieties. They grow like little flowers. They look a lot like, they have a cousin that's a, a marginally legal medicinal herb. You know, they're not the old school hops. We started making our IPA in 95, right? Uh -huh. and, uh, immediately it became our flagship because the first people that drank it said, my God, nobody's going to drink this. And we went, yes. <laughs> May I show you the brew house? Come on this way. A malt is brought in by the computer, transferred to this tank here, which is a mash ton. This is transferred to this tank here, which is called the louder ton. That sugar water flows over here to the kettle. And then at the right moment in the process, the, the, some of this is diverted to those hop dosing units. And here, it's transferred to that tank down there. It's mixed with yeast and directed to a fermentation tank. 14 days later, you have beer. This is where we keep Bob. He has to stay there, he guards the tank. From here, it goes back on into the brewery, gets filtered, out to the bottling line, immediately out to the world. I think one of the most fascinating things about craft beer is how innovative it, it, it's been. It, it's taken traditional styles and kind of ran with them. And today, uh, more styles are brewed in the United States than any other country in the world. The craft brew is extraordinarily important sort of in the 
kind of the economic model of beer in the country in terms of providing uh, uh, choices for people. Today's uh, beer industry includes about 1,440 breweries, four of which uh, are about 95% of the industry. They make the very lightest beer imaginable in order to create the lowest common denominator of flavor so that their marketing and their image is what people buy into. And there's nothing about the flavor that challenges that decision for them. Bottom line, there is a difference. And Bud Light has it. It's called drinkability. That just right taste, not too heavy, not too light. But those beers are extraordinarily difficult to make, and we couldn't make one if, if our life depended on it. Our beers are big and robust and crazy, and a lot of ingredients are sort of like making chili, you know? It's hard to make a bad chili, but you can make a more beautiful chili if you work hard at it and develop some skills, and that's the business that we're all in. I think you'll continue to see the market being driven by the craft brewer industry. It's the fastest growing segment. It probably will be for years to come. Yeah, that's true. That's the best time to, to be a, to love beer right now. Couldn't ask for a better uh, better thing on a fall evening than a, a big, rich, chocolatey OVL stout from Russian River Brewing Company. These days, uh, in international competition, not only does the United States do better than really any other country, uh, in the last two years in the World Beer Cup, for example, California, the state itself, won more medals than every country except for Germany. God, USA, best beer ever. You know? Here's the freedom choice and great American beer. For Reason TV, I'm Nick Gillespie.